welcome to North River Church Online. We are so glad you've chosen to worship with us today. As we continue in phase two, we'll offer two Sunday morning services, 9 a.m. and 10.15 a.m. We do ask that you continue to register each week. The link will remain the same, but you can continue to find the link on our website and Facebook page. We are nearing the end of construction and will be moving into our new facility before we know it. We are less than $675,000 away from reaching our goal of walking into our building debt-free. In light of this goal, we launched the Giving Tree campaign a couple of weeks ago, showing you exactly what we need to reach that goal. You should have received a Giving Tree packet in the mail. If not, you can pick up an envelope from the back table following a Sunday service or email nrc at gonorthriver.org. You can also find a video on our website with information about the packet and how you can help us reach our goal of being debt free. A number of you have responded in the last couple of weeks and we have been able to fill in 27 leaves as well as fill in $22,321 on the trunk of the tree so far. There are 41 leaves remaining on the tree and we would love for everyone to participate in this giving campaign. No gift is too small to make an impact. Please have your gifts in by August 30th and thank you so much for your generosity. Over the last four months of uncertainty, you've been faithful to give to our regular budget as well as the building fund. If you'd like to give today, you can give online through our website, gonorthriver.org slash give, or by texting NRC in the amount to 73256. If you'd like to give online toward the giving tree, simply add a memo regarding which leaf you're giving towards. We have an opportunity to partner once again with Bridge of Life, a foster care ministry in our community. They are conducting a mask and hand sanitizer drive, and we will be collecting these items this coming week. The masks can be disposable or reusable in children or adult sizes. If you'd like to help, please bring these items to the church office during business hours or to a Sunday morning service this coming Sunday. Life Groups will launch the week of Sunday, September 13th. You'll be hearing more information regarding Life Groups in the coming weeks. In the meantime, please be praying about being a part of a life group and enjoying community that is found in the body of Christ. Thank you again for joining us online. We invite you to worship with us as we sing and hear from God's word. Let's worship together. Strength will rise as we wait upon
Church family, once again, we have the joy of gathering around God's Word and studying it together. And so I want to encourage you to grab your copy of the Scriptures and join me in Acts chapter 19. We're going to spend time this morning in Acts chapter 19, verse 1 through verse 10. And the title of the message is Sealed by the Spirit. So as we dive into Acts chapter 19, I want to just take you back just a little bit in time as we think about, I'm a, I'm a student of history, love history, and one of the things I've always been fascinated with is wax seals that they used to put on letters. They don't do that anymore. In fact, I don't think you could even put one on a letter and send it through the postal system right now. I don't think there's any way possible to do that. But back in the day, back in olden times, a seal was important. In fact, Kings and uh, rulers would use seals as they were uh, crafting official documents or as they were sending letters to other kingdoms and things like that. They would have their own seal, some type of maybe signet ring or some type of stamp that they would stamp as their seal on this letter that they were sending out. It made that letter, it made that decree official. It was the real deal. It was from this person. And so uh, I always was fascinated seeing in movies and things like that a wax seal where you would take a candle and pour out a little bit of the wax onto the back of an envelope or onto a letter or something like that. And you would take and do some type of stamp and seal that envelope or that piece of mail or that letter. You know, as we are diving into Acts chapter 19, what we're going to talk about is another type of seal. And in the Christian life, it's the seal of the Spirit. And so as we read Acts chapter 19, I want us to keep in the back of our mind as we're going to encounter Paul and his time in Ephesus as he shares the gospel of Jesus there. I want you to to listen to these words from Ephesians chapter 1, verse 13. You see, this was a letter that Paul had written back to the Ephesians, those that we're going to see him encounter here in Acts chapter 19. And this is what he writes to them in verse 13. He says this about these believers. In him, talking about Jesus Christ, you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation and believed in him. Listen to this. This is where the seal comes in. You were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory. And so as we are going to dive into Acts chapter 19, what we're going to see is this on display. We're going to see this conversation, this discussion take place about being sealed with the Holy Spirit. When we trust Jesus as our Savior, we are sealed by the Spirit. It makes it official that we are children of God. So I want to read the text for us. I want us to walk back through it together in the next few minutes. This is what Luke records beginning in Acts chapter 19, verse 1. And it happened that while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul passed through the inland country and came to Ephesus, and there he found some disciples. And he said to them, Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? And they said, No, we have not even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. And he said, Into what then were you baptized? And they said, Into John's baptism. And Paul said, John baptized with the baptism of repentance telling the people to believe in the one who was to come after him, that is, Jesus. On hearing this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul had laid his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them, and they began speaking in tongues and prophesying. And there were about twelve men in all. And he entered the synagogue and for three months spoke boldly, reasoning and persuading them about the kingdom of God. But when some became stubborn and continued in unbelief, speaking evil of the way before the congregation, he withdrew from them and took the disciples with him, reasoning daily in the hall of Tyrannus. This continued for two years so that all the residents of Asia heard the word of the Lord, both Jews and Greeks. Father, we ask this morning that you would open our eyes that we'd be able to see 
that you would open our ears that we would be able to hear, and that you would open our hearts and our minds that we would be ready to respond to your word and to your spirit. We ask all of this in Jesus' name, and everyone said, amen. As we look at Acts chapter 19, don't forget that it comes on the heels of what we talked about last week at the last part there of Acts chapter 18. Remember, we were introduced to Apollos in Acts chapter 18, those last few verses. And we said about Apollos that he was a very devoutly religious person. He was a Jew, but he didn't know the full message of the gospel until Aquila and Priscilla pulled him aside after hearing him talk about the Savior who was to come and shared with him that Jesus Christ was that long-awaited Savior that he had been looking for. Now, what's going on here is that Paul is traveling through Ephesus. That's where we first encountered Apollos, and he was teaching in the synagogue there. Apollos has left and gone to Corinth, and so as we pick up here in verse 1, we see that while Apollos was at Corinth, that Paul passed through the inland country, and he came to the city of Ephesus. So, Apollos has left Ephesus. He's gone to Corinth to preach the gospel there. But while he was in Ephesus, before he knew who Jesus was, he had been teaching in the synagogue. And it's very, very likely, in fact, probable that these 12 disciples, as they're called in Acts chapter 19, are likely disciples of Apollos. And they are locked in to the previous message, not yet the full message of the gospel, that Apollos had been teaching in Ephesus. And so Paul is journeying through Ephesus, and he's going to encounter these 12 men. And so I want you to notice that as we look at the text this morning, as we look at verses 1 through 3, as we pick back up here, I want you to notice the first truth that we see here. These men were religious but they did not have a relationship with Jesus. And Paul is going to see that, and he's going to expose that and bring that to their attention. Notice what Paul says. It says he found some disciples. Verse 2, he said to these disciples, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? It's an interesting question that Paul asks here, and it's an important question because What it does for us is remind us that at the moment of salvation, when we trust Jesus as our Savior and are forgiven of our sins, the Holy Spirit of God, the third person in the Trinity, comes to indwell our lives, the life of every single believer. And so in this moment, Paul is pressing in and asking a specific question. These are supposedly disciples. And so he asked them, which should be true of every disciple, then have you received the Holy Spirit? Is the Holy Spirit residing, dwelling within you? Because salvation, trusting Jesus as our Savior, and being indwelt by the Holy Spirit go together. They're not two separate things. They're not two separate events. They work simultaneously together. When we are saved from our sins, the Holy Spirit indwells us. And so that's the question that Paul is asking here. He knows that they're very religious. He knows that they are disciples. That's how they're described. But notice their response. They said, no, we have not even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. Well, ding, 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 there's a problem there because we know that those two things come together, that when they've trusted Jesus as their Savior, they receive the Holy Spirit. We know those two things come together. And so in this instant, Paul knows that there's a problem, knows that there's something deficient here. And so they say, we didn't even know there was a Holy Spirit. And so Paul says, "Mm, we have a problem here. And he said to them, into what then were you baptized? And they said, into John's baptism. Well, remember last week in Acts chapter 18, the last part there, when we encountered Apollos, that was Apollos' message. It was John's baptism, which we said last week was a baptism of repentance. It was a baptism of expectation. It was looking forward to the Messiah coming. And we said that Apollos didn't know the full story. He didn't know the rest of the story of who Jesus was. But that's the same thing with these 12 men here. They don't know the full story. They just know part of the story. And that's where the problem lies. They're religious people. Like they are 
worried about when is the Messiah coming. They're looking for the Messiah to come. They're thinking about that. They've gone so far as to be baptized in John's baptism, which is a baptism of repentance. Like they are dialed in, religiously speaking, but they don't have a relationship yet with Jesus Christ. And therein lies the rub for Paul. Paul knows that's an issue. That is a problem. And that leads us to the second truth that we see in the text, verses 4 and 5, that they, these 12 men, received the gospel message and followed in believer's baptism. They were religious without a relationship with Jesus, but that all changes in verses 4 and 5 when they trust Jesus as their Savior, their Messiah. Look with me in verse 4. Paul said, John baptized with the baptism of repentance. We just talked about that. Telling the people to believe in the one who was to come after him, that is Jesus. So that was John's message, believe in the one who comes after me. The one John would say as he's teaching, whose sandal strap I'm not worthy to untie. That's what he knew was true about Jesus Christ, the Messiah. Believe in him, he says. And so at this point, Paul says, this was John's message And John was pointing forward to the true Messiah coming. And we know that that true Messiah is Jesus. And so he says, on hearing this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. So after they heard the full message of the gospel, they believed in Jesus as their Savior, as their Messiah, who would be able to forgive them of their sins. And notice that they followed in believer's baptism because they realized that John's baptism was not enough. It was not what Jesus had prescribed. In fact, Jesus had called his disciples to follow in baptism, which is a public declaration of what Christ has done in our lives. And so these disciples who were disciples of John, probably disciples of Apollos, didn't yet know who Jesus was. Paul shares the gospel with them. They trust Jesus as their Savior. And then they follow in obedience and are baptized publicly, declaring for everyone that Jesus Christ is the Messiah. He is their Savior. I want you to notice what happens in verses 6 and 7, the third truth that we encounter in the text. And it's this life transformation that experienced right here with these 12 men was confirmed when they received the Holy Spirit. Now we said salvation and the Holy Spirit go together. When we trust Jesus as our Savior, the Holy Spirit comes and indwells every single believer. And so what we see right here in verse 6 is this truth lived out, played out. And as we think about the verse I read from Ephesians, he's talking about that right here, that these believers were sealed with the Holy Spirit, that they were awaiting and ready for their inheritance because they were children of God. Notice what happens, verse 6, when Paul laid his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them. And they began speaking in tongues and prophesying, and there were about 12 men in all. Now, you may get a little uneasy about what happens right here, but I don't want you to lose sight of what we've said previously as we've encountered this same type of thing happening in the book of Acts. Remember, if we rewind just a little bit to Acts chapter 2, we are reminded there that the Holy Spirit shows up in the exact same way on the day of Pentecost. As the gospel is preached by Peter with all nations there, the Holy Spirit shows up in that instant in tongues of fire, and the gift of tongues is utilized there by the early disciples. They are able to speak in the languages of the people who are gathered there that were gathered from all types of of places and all languages. We also see this exact same thing happen in Acts chapter 10. We see it there though with the Gentiles. We see that, remember we had been given the command to make disciples of all nations beginning in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria to the ends of the earth. And so we saw the beginning there in Acts chapter 10 of the gospel moving outside of primarily Jewish circles to reach the uttermost parts of the earth, the Gentiles. And the exact same thing happens there as 
the Holy Spirit demonstrates the truth of the gospel taking root in the hearts of the Gentiles, that this is real, God's seal and stamp of approval that Gentiles can be saved from their sins, just like the Jews were saved from their sins in Acts chapter 2. And we see this exact same thing play out here. And I don't think it's insignificant because when you think about where Ephesus is located, uh, from where the disciples were right outside of Jerusalem in Acts chapter 10, it's a good distance away. It's a long journey away. And what we've said as we've walked through this, that as the gospel is piercing into the darkness, that the Holy Spirit often moves in extraordinary, magnificent ways to capture the attention of the people and help them understand that the message that's being proclaimed is of the Lord. And I think that's exactly what's going on here in Acts chapter 19 in the city of Ephesus, that God is sending his Holy Spirit to place his stamp of approval on the gospel going forth in this location. And what we see happen as a result of that, beginning in verse 8, listen to what happens. And he, that's talking about Paul, after this happens with these 12 men, it says, He entered the synagogue for three months, spoke boldly, reasoning, persuading them about the kingdom of God. Some became stubborn and continued in unbelief, speaking evil of the way, that's Christianity, before the congregation. He withdrew from them and took the disciples with him, reasoning daily in the hall of Tyrannus. Now, I want you to know something here. Paul is doing exactly what he often does, goes to the Jews first, goes to the Gentiles. But notice what happens in verse 10. This continued for two years. So post the Holy Spirit showing up in an incredible way to demonstrate that the gospel message that's being proclaimed by Paul is the truth and sealing that in the lives of these 12 men. This continued, the gospel spreading in Ephesus for two years, listen, so that all the residents of Asia heard the word of the Lord, both Jews and Greeks. Now, this is not insignificant. In fact, this is very, very important as we think about the truth that this action, Paul sharing the truth of the gospel, those believing the truth of the gospel, the Holy Spirit placing his stamp of approval and sealing these believers and demonstrating his power further opens the door for Paul to share the gospel throughout all of Asia so that in two years, think about this, in two years, every single person, whether Jew or Greek, has heard the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ. What an amazing story. What an amazing thing to think about. What if every person in our community heard the gospel of Jesus Christ? Let's take a few minutes to worship together, and then we'll dive back into the text and think about some specific application.
things that demand my attention. You have to bow, oh, you have to bow. Fear and depression, shame and confusion. You have to bow, oh, you have to bow. All lesser things that demand my attention. As we gather back around Acts chapter 19, these first 10 verses, I want us to think about some specific application from the text in our own lives. And I think they're a great place to start as we think about these quote-unquote disciples, disciples of Apollos or disciples of John who were religious but didn't have a relationship with Jesus Christ. I think that's important for us to ask this question. Why is it important to understand the difference between being religious and and having a relationship with Jesus. Now, I want you to understand something. This, I think, is incredibly important for us to grasp because there's this idea that Christianity is primarily about religion, that Christianity is a religion, and the whole goal of religion is trying to figure out how to get to God, that that's what religion is all about. And here, what we're seeing is that play out in the lives of these 12 men, that they are religious people. They are doing the right things. In fact, they've even gone so far as to be baptized, and they're they're looking for the Messiah. They don't know who he is yet, and they're waiting, and they're thinking about that. And here's the thing that's important, I think, for us to understand, that just because we do the right things doesn't mean that we have a relationship with Jesus. And I think people have that mixed up in our culture. They think that that's primarily what we're talking about when we talk about Christianity, but that's not at all what the message of the gospel is. In fact, the message of the gospel is not how we can get to God. The message of the gospel is that we can't get to God, that we are sinners who are separated from Him, that there's no good that we can do, so much of it that'll get us favor with God. That's the reason we need Jesus. That's the reason we need a Savior. That's the reason we need a Messiah. And so when we recognize that Christianity is not about how we can get to God, in fact, it's about how God came to us. Jesus Christ, the very Son of God, left the throne room of heaven and came to this earth, taking on flesh, a baby born in a manger, who grew up and lived a sinless life and took your sin and my sin on the cross, died there paying for our sin, was buried and raised again on the third day. Jesus came to us. God stooped down 
to us to save us because we couldn't save ourselves. And so Christianity is not a religion. It's not about how we get to God. It's how Jesus came to this earth, took on flesh so that he could die for us. That is what we're talking about. That's why we say that it's not religion. It's a relationship. It's not checking a list of do's and don'ts. It's walking in relationship with God. That's what Christianity is all about. And I want us to think about that and to understand that and be able to communicate that to people who may have a misguided understanding of what Christianity is. We should be at the forefront of sharing with them. Christianity is not about how you can get to God. You can't get to God. There's no way possible. But he came to this earth for you. He laid his life down to have a relationship with you. He took the initiative that you could never take so that you could be forgiven of your sins and have a relationship with him. I want us to think about this second question, though. Have you received the gospel and followed in believer's baptism? You know, as we are looking here, what we encounter is the fact that these men who were religious but didn't yet have a relationship with Jesus, that they heard the gospel, Paul shared with them the truth of who Jesus was, they believed it. They trusted Jesus as their Savior, as the Messiah that they had longed for and looked for. They believed his death, burial, and resurrection. They had faith in Jesus as their Savior. But notice what followed that. Not only did they take that step, but they also took the step of following in believers' baptism. You may be watching this morning and, and you're listening now and you have not taken the step of trusting Jesus Christ as your Savior as these disciples did here. You've heard the message of the gospel. You've heard even just in the past couple of minutes that it's not about religion. It's about a relationship with God through Jesus Christ, His Son. And you need to take that step of trusting Jesus as your Savior. You have an opportunity to do that right now. And maybe you have taken that step, but you've not taken that follow-up step taking the step of publicly declaring what Christ has done in you through baptism. That's what baptism is. It's publicly declaring that you have been cleansed of your sins. Not that going down under the water and coming out washes away your sins. That's not it at all. We know that it's Jesus' blood that cleanses us from our sins. But it's symbolic. It demonstrates. It's a word picture of what's going on when Christ saves us. And so maybe for you, you know that's the step that I need to take. And maybe you're like these disciples. You'd already been baptized. Maybe you've been baptized as a child or something before you trusted Jesus as your Savior. But the Scriptures call us to follow in baptism after salvation. And that's exactly what we see modeled here. And maybe that's the step that you need to take as well. We're planning right now as best we can, hopefully with the restrictions in place and all that's going on this COVID season, to have a baptism service on September the 20th on our church property. That's our goal. That's our target. That's where we're going to be shooting for. And so I want to encourage you, if you've not taken that step of trusting Jesus as your Savior or you've not taken the step of following in believer's baptism, would you reach out to us and let us know that and let us walk with you through taking that next step. And then I want to close out and ask this final question. It's an important question. It's the centerpiece, I believe, of what's going on in the text this morning. And it's this, what is the role of the Holy Spirit and why does it matter? What's the role of the Holy Spirit and why does it matter? You know, there's several things that the Holy Spirit does. It's the third person of the Trinity. You have the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And oftentimes we talk a lot about the Father, we talk a lot about the Son. We don't often talk about the Holy Spirit as much, but it's the Holy Spirit that first brings conviction of sin in our lives to help us see that we need a Savior. That's the role of the Holy Spirit. That's the work of the Holy Spirit to help us see our sin and to draw us to the Lord. And so that's one role that the Holy Spirit plays. But also the Holy Spirit plays an important role in indwelling the life of every single believer. 
So remember, as we talked earlier in the text, that Paul makes that connection that when we trust Jesus as our Savior, that the Holy Spirit comes and indwells us. He knew there was a problem with these quote-unquote disciples because the Holy Spirit didn't indwell them. And so he knew that those two things have to go together. And I want us to recognize that. And I want us to maybe even reflect a bit on Paul's words to the church in Ephesus, these same believers when he wrote a letter back to them and reminded them of what the Holy Spirit has done in their life. And that the Holy Spirit seals us. And it's through that seal, that stamp of approval of God on our lives saying we are his child. We are the real deal. We are authentic believers. That is true about us. That's what the Holy Spirit is in our lives, a stamp, a seal of approval from the Lord. Not only that, the Holy Spirit is at work in our lives too, bearing fruit in the life of every single believer. And so as we walk with Jesus, as we walk in relationship with our Heavenly Father, the Holy Spirit is working in our lives to bring fruit in our lives. And you've probably heard the verse or maybe even heard the song about love and joy and peace and patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, self-control, the fruits of the Spirit, those things that should be evident and true about us because the Holy Spirit is at work in our hearts transforming us to look more like Jesus Christ. And it's the role of the Holy Spirit as well in the life of a believer to help us recognize and convict us of sin even in the life of a believer so that we know that there is distance in our relationship with the Lord. And here's the thing. As we think about the role of the Holy Spirit, I want you to to just pause for a bit. And just think about that reality that Paul reminds the believers of in Ephesians 1 verse 13, that it is the Holy Spirit who is the guarantee of our inheritance as children of God. He is the seal on our lives that we are believers, that we are Christians, that we've been transformed by the grace of God. I want you to bow your heads and close your eyes with me. And as we pause right now for a time of invitation and singing as we close out our service, I want to ask you, have you taken that step of trusting Jesus as your Savior? Maybe you need to take that step today. And you simply need to say, God, I know that I'm a sinner. And I know that I need to be saved from my sins. And I know that I can't save myself. I can't be religious enough. And I know that Jesus Christ, your son, came to this earth to die for my sins, and he was raised from the grave. And I believe in him. I trust in him as my Savior. Maybe that's the prayer that you need to pray this morning. Maybe you need to make the commitment today that you are going to take this opportunity to take the next step. You've trusted Jesus as your Savior, but you need to follow in believer's baptism as we see Jesus command In Acts chapter 2, as we see lived out throughout the book of Acts, as we see lived out right here in our text this morning in Acts chapter 19, you need to take that step that these new believers took, be baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus, declaring publicly what Christ has done in your life. And then I want to encourage you, believer, rest in the truth that the Holy Spirit of God is the seal of of God's approval in your life, that His Holy Spirit dwells within you, declaring that you are His child. That's the seal of the Holy Spirit. Father, use this time in our lives. Help us respond to you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You sing with us.
Thank you for worshiping with us this morning. We encourage you to stay connected through our social media channels throughout the week. Be safe and well, and have a great week.